Today, I want to talk about installing outlets in your car to power appliances and other devices. Even if you have cigarette lighter type outlets or USB outlets, living or camping in your car may require you to install the type of outlets that are found in homes. And that is what I will talk about installing today. First, I want to apologize for the fact that it's been over three months since my last video. As I mentioned in previous videos, one of the reasons I moved into my car in July of last year was to move to Silicon Valley and build a new career as an artificial intelligence tech entrepreneur. Over the last few months, I have been working on launching my first tech startups, so work has been my entire focus, all day, every day. That being said, I am less than a week away from my one-year anniversary for car living, so I figured it was time to start posting videos again. Today, we will look at inverters. Inverters are the devices that allow you to install power outlets in your car. Inverters convert your car's DC, or direct current power, which is battery power, to AC, or alternating current power, which is the type of power that comes out of outlets inside of homes and businesses. Over the years, I have purchased five different inverters of different types and sizes, and presently I have two inverters in my car to charge things like my electric toothbrush, my electric shaver, my laptop, and to run things like my refrigerator and my new microwave. I have two inverters simply because I upgraded recently and I decided to leave my 1000 watt inverter installed for daily use and add a 1500 watt inverter for powering my new microwave. However, you only need one inverter that is powerful enough to run all of your devices that you have in your car. The size of an inverter is measured in terms of the watts that it can produce. So, you will need to look at the items you will be running and figure out the maximum amount of wattage that you will need at any one time. For example, I have a microwave and refrigerator that will sometimes be running at the same time, so I need to add together the wattages to figure out how much power they will use when they are both running. My refrigerator only draws 66 watts, but I have a microwave that is advertised as a 700 watt microwave. Unfortunately, when I hooked up the microwave to my 1000 watt inverter, it kept overloading the inverter and causing it to turn off. That is because there is a difference between how much wattage an item uses during its regular use and its peak wattage, which usually occurs as it is powering on. So you can't always trust the advertised wattage of things like microwaves that use high wattage when determining the size of the inverter you will need. For example, when I did a Google search for the peak wattage of 700 watt microwaves, I found out that the average wattage input needed for 700 watt microwave is close to 1000 watts. Go figure. I measured the power usage of my microwave and it actually draws over 1000 watts at its peak when it is powering on, so that is why it keeps overloading my 1000 watt inverter. Because the power items use can fluctuate, it is always good to have an inverter that has more power than you think you need. I recommend overestimating the amount of power you need by about 50%. Let me show you how to make that calculation. First, start by determining your present needs by researching the power usage of your devices. For example, I bought my refrigerator and my microwave on Amazon, so I looked in the question and answer sections for those products to see what people posted about their power usage. You can also do searches on Google for what are called product specifications to see how many watts an item uses. The most powerful things I will ever run together are the refrigerator and microwave, which add up to a little over 1,000 watts of power. To add an additional 50%, I take half of that 1000 watts, which is 500. Then I add the additional 500 watts to get a total of 1500 watts. That is why I purchased a larger 1500 watt inverter for my car. Inverters aren't cheap, which is why you do these calculations. You want an inverter that will power your items, but you don't want to pay too much for an inverter that has way more power than you need. High-powered inverters can be very large and cost over $1,000. The brand of 1,500-watt inverter that I bought cost about $180, but I got it on sale for $160, so it pays to shop around. 
One thing that you want to make sure of when you purchase any inverter is that you pay a little extra to get what is called a pure sine wave inverter. In fact, let's take a moment to talk about the types of inverters, because there are two main types which are called pure sine wave and square wave. These names refer to the shape of the lines on a screen when the devices are hooked up to an oscilloscope, which is just a fancy power meter. A pure sine wave inverter creates a smooth and even flow of energy. That is the type of energy that comes into homes and businesses from power companies. That is the type of power that you want, because that is what appliances and devices are designed to use. The square wave is simply a cheaper type of power output that is more choppy and can damage some devices. When you're searching on Amazon or other sites for an inverter, specifically search for pure sine wave inverters. If you just search for inverters, then you will get results with much cheaper options, but they will be the square wave inverters. They don't say square wave, but if they don't specifically say pure sine wave, then they are the square wave or some cheap modified wave inverter that may damage or ruin your devices. When powering things like appliances in your car, the other thing you need to consider is whether you will need to keep some things running while your car is off. For example, I have a refrigerator that I keep running even when I am in the office working during the day. When my car is off and I am working, I have a power station that can provide power to my refrigerator. Power stations are a whole nother subject, so I will talk about them in my next video. Well, I hope this video has provided you with helpful information. If you have any questions, then please feel free to leave them in the comments section below. I try to respond to every question and comment that people leave. Also, please subscribe to this channel by clicking the subscribe button in the lower right hand corner of the screen. I don't post crazy or sexy pictures as clickbait for my videos on YouTube, so my subscribers are the handful of people who really appreciate valuable information and are interested in car living or car camping. If that is what you're looking for, then please don't forget to subscribe. And thank you for taking the time to watch this video.